Hello. How's it, how's it? Hey, yeah. Uh, how's it going? <laughs> Good. There's only something so unceremonious about how this all happens. One just pops in to the screen. Unjani? I can't, but it's been, it's been a day. It's yeah. been a Monday. <laughs> I don't have those. I just dive <laughs> right in. I just dive right in. I'll see myself on Thursday. Oh, and stuff. God. But today yeah, was a very, very nice one. Definitely, though. Because, um, yeah, I gave a nice report back to the, to the guys in um, Lovedale uh, about how we've been going on. They're very happy with the little that we've raised, which is 4,000 rands. And we're very grateful to everyone who's joining us and has participated. I see some faces and some names already of people who have helped us out since we um, started with our fundraiser on the 15th of this month. Yeah? Can you, you believe that it's been... Tell me, tell me, tell you more about things. Yeah. So, I was um, just thinking... Yeah? I was just thinking today that I can't believe that it's only been two weeks since we started um, the project kind of officially. And we had only really begun in earnest about three weeks before that. So this is still like a baby, baby. Yeah. Um, but it's been unbelievably encouraging and heartwarming and really does feel the fire because this is a, this is a love project for you and me. We both have mm -hmm. other lives that are kind of the things that help us pay the rent, right? But yeah. Um, we feel really strongly about Lovedale, uh, the work it's produced. We're feeling some type of way about it being in danger. And so to know that there's so many people who are affected by the work that it's produced and cannot believe, cannot believe that it's in so much trouble, that just like this, it could disappear. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's one, yeah. one has to be shocked and then one has to roll up their sleeves and go like, what can we do? And that's what's been happening though for the past while. Like everyone has just been reeling from shock that how could a place like this, um, A, not be known that much in the, in the country and the region. And secondly, how can a place like this, um, yeah, just, just go by the wayside and, 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 and run the risk, very, very close risk now of it closing because yeah i remember it was last year august when i went there for the first time to go and and speak about what we can do as as society maybe about the lovedale college um debacle um they had a november that they had been promised that they have to be out by then so already by last year august november was the d-day for them to leave um, and then we, we came here, Mali and I, um, to come and stay during this COVID time. And we thought about them. We thought about, um, hell, what are, they, what, what are they doing at this time whereby everyone is being told not to have an income, not to have a place of work where they can actually get um, that income. So I think that's when we intensified about three, four weeks ago where it was like, hey man, um, we need to get together and do something. And that first conversation happens with the post that we put out, um, basically saying, okay, this, these are the books that are published there, there's what's happening there. And um, the, the, the response once again was overwhelming from there. Do you wanna, do you wanna just um, tell people how they gave us this push because that's really what we're living on, no? Yeah. Um... I don't, I don't know if people want their names to be mentioned, so I'll keep people's names out of it, but maybe describe what it is that they do. Um, mm. One singer-songwriter wrote, you know, everything that I do is based off of the books that I read that were published by Lovedale mm. and published at Lovedale. I wouldn't be writing and singing is, in Iskosa um, had it not been for that treasure trove that gave my language legitimacy, depth, yeah. um, texture, um, it, and gave me stories where I could really see myself and my circumstances um, represented. Yeah. Um, I had a 
beautiful conversation with Buddha Mandlana. I know he won't mind me mentioning his name. Yes. Um, he's a one of one my particular that I saw him here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. Oh, amazing, amazing. Mandlan Botwe, the Mandlan Botwe, who finally yeah. got um, awarded a Fleur de Cap. Yeah, a, couple a of Fleur de Cap. Ago. That's incredible. And he was saying to me that when he was growing up, his geography teacher would spend 20 minutes reading um, a part of a novel from yeah. that was published at La Fleur Press. And that was one of his introductions to storytelling to that you know um yeah. and he's never forgotten it that there was yeah. this need for people to create the kinds of spaces that don't necessarily exist in the systems that we find ourselves in yeah to have Absolutely. your language and your story articulated and to have a geography teacher not an english teacher not an Esposa teacher not, mm. but a geography teacher to say you know, this is, this is part, the, your whole, your education is holistic. If you don't know yeah. who you are, what are you learning? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, that'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, <laughs> that's the thing. Um, our introduction to language, our introduction to reading, our introduction to sophisticating many, many thoughts we have in our heads, right? For me, does spring partly from, from Lovedale. And um, I think that the actions of the past couple of weeks are us as well, tying up some strings about what our relationship with language is, just on, <laughs> on cue right there. Uh, because for me, I grew up with um, older siblings who had these as textbooks. So um, I would read, I would read, I would read those, but I would go then to a school that A, did not have it as a subject, B, did not even see the language that is, is, is in these books as sophisticated or could somehow be of benefit to my imagination in the modern world, do you know what I mean? Um, so I think that is a political push as well. My parents were, were always pushing for us to read in indigenous languages, um, to know about the characters and the humanities in these books you know, so that maybe we can be invested, maybe we cannot be invested. There's a beautiful um, 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 option or, or, or there's beautiful options that come in actually speaking and expressing yourself in more than one language, which is something that fascinates me. Um, the nuance that's in the books, of course, then keeps me going because I start feeling, because my whole work as well is about memorializing, right? It's about memorializing those who um, have been silenced or those, um, I don't feel that there are people who, um, yeah, who are voiceless. I always feel like that, that someone is making an effort somewhere to silence you. And I've moved um, um, around in the world like that, whereby I am pushing back at those who I might think are silencing me. So um, I think that the first sort of like silencing happens when someone is saying that the language is not sophisticated enough the language will not, A, make you a living, um, and B, it has no space in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that even as a 10-year-old or even as an 8-year-old or even as whatever old you have, then this, um, this, um, this attitude towards your mother tongue, and it comes from that split whereby at home you'd speak as it costs, like, with English, and then when you go to the suburban schools, you would speak English, um, I was thinking even before we, we hooked up now, there was a certain threat that would come in the suburban schools when we would be all a group speaking as it Corsa. Like, I think there was a certain power that I felt when it's like, no, you cannot be together speaking, gather together, speaking this language, right? Because maybe it is a threat. Maybe it is a, it is a, it is a throwback to 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 frontier war times <laughs> i don't know but i was always very fascinated by the power that comes in a group of people speaking a language that you do not understand especially in a country like ours whereby language is highly racialized right um so i think that um lovedale comes at a point and i think we're somehow drawing the importance of of still keeping spaces like this to fight that idea of it not belonging to the um, yeah, <laughs> for us to 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 to, to not to not um, feel that it doesn't belong in the twenty first century, whatever that is, 
Um, secondly, it not being sophisticated, you know, um, and not worth saving, which is the dignity part. Yeah. Oh, Victory of the Word just asked us a question. Before, do, will you just note that question? Because there's another part of that experience. I mean, you and I are the same age. We're in our mid, yeah. we're in our we're in our mid thirties. We're in our mid thirties. Don't say it too long. <laughs> but there was something. So I entered grade one just after Mandela was released. So I was in grade one, nineteen ninety two, mm. and it's interesting this thing that you say about feeling power when that teacher, right, is Mrs. Rasmus or whoever. Yes. It says, stop, stop speaking that language. Stop yeah. speaking that language. You don't, you don't talk that here. That, that, right? Yeah. And how that, as a young, impressionable somebody in the foundation stages of your development, start to see the language that comes out of your mouth as being something to be shameful of something to keep hidden away, mm. something, as you say, to be silence, actively silence. Mm. And we mustn't forget that there was also a whole project. And I think there are a lot of people who, who share this, this kind of experience where English was seen as a, as a way of gaining a kind of power an economic power, as it were. Mm. And so rightfully or wrongly, consciously or unconsciously, many black parents made the decision to start speaking more English at home. Yes. Um, and I guess because they always grew up around their own languages, didn't realize how active, how, active, how you have to keep your, the other languages alive, otherwise they disappear, mm. right? They start to atrophy and then, yeah. and then you're like, left clamoring for them. And it's incredibly yeah. painful, incredibly sad. And so that's, that's my story, right? Yeah. That I grew up from grade two, basically, speaking less and less and less as Kosa and Sesotho, and more and more English, and really leaning towards wanting to do well in Afrikaans, not really thinking that this Zulu class was really anything to be taken seriously because hello yeah. was taught by a white lady. So there was something about even the power that languages held in those academic spaces that felt like there was definitely a hierarchy that they, that they sat in. Yeah. Um, and then I, I mission off to UCT and I'm thrown into this is cause a English bilingual class. And I've told this story before, and I'll tell it quickly because sometimes it makes me cry. And this is the first time Mandela and I meet. Mm. Um, I had been, I was late to, to arrive to class, about a week late. And the previous week, the class had already been given a task where they had to go and find out their clan names. And in this, this class, the class, we were going to tutor ourselves, right? Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't found out what the task was. I was like, this is like high school. Like the first week is just a getting to know you situation, not knowing that there was a task now that I had to perform. And there were five of us in this class. So there's no way to kind of hope that they hide. will get to you because they will get to you. You can't hide. Yeah. Um, so the one person goes, the other person goes, the other person goes, and then it gets to me. And I'm just like, okay, up you go. And I was like, mm. <laughs> can't do it and he's like what do you mean i'm sure you can um and then he he says my name and he's like oh you must be so to do it in Sosotu. and i was like mm, not mm. even <laughs> not even Manda, how access, could you <laughs> access denied and that and f f before then i had been able to kind of navigate my way between not ever having to confront that my mother tongue mother tongue hmm. my home language was not my primary language yeah when i'm with the part of the family they kind of just assume that is is the the main language because my mom is Kosa. yeah and so we get away with speaking english there right and then like snippets of susu to whatever and then when we're home in the eastern cape they're like no man these guys are sutus that's why they're not like tethering with us <laughs> yeah, and so tethering. you get away with that <laughs> so you get to like 
navigate these spaces sort of just by like code switching wherever you go and being basically in disguise in plain sight until you're confronted with these moments where you're like, oh my God, I don't know who I am. And it was through Buzani Kubao, which was published at Lovedale. Written oh. by uh, Tamsangwa, W.K. Tamsangwa. Yeah. Yeah. V, <laughs> that we were introduced, that I was reintroduced to my mother tongue. And it was, a, it was a, a cathartic experience, but it was also incredibly painful that you're like, wow, I've, I feel like I've been away from home for so long. Yeah. That's what it felt like. And what was interesting to observe was even the students, my fellow actors, who would consider themselves, and I would certainly consider themselves, consider them as proficient in Isposa, who speak Isposa as a home language, were discovering how deep this Isposa yeah. goes. Yeah. How poetic, yeah. how expansive, yeah. how colorful. Um, like every and language, and not, and not as an albatross around your neck, but as with every language, most of these languages pack the same punch. And this might sound very, very elementary to many people, of course, do you know what I mean? But there are moments whereby truly this is your reality and you do not have is it closer to actually like sophisticate and find all of that. But I remember the moment, the, like those moments whereby, whereby um, uh, it really, really hits you that this is such a beautiful language. Do you know, and Buzani Kubao is, is, is one of those moments whereby there's just this guy repeating Buzani Kubao, Buzani Kubao. And then you delve in, you realize things about mental illness. You, you discover so much about, you know, uh, being forced with tradition. You start seeing your face with all of this happening. And, and I think it was in that reflection that I found a dignity. And that dignity then would give me the strength to continue reading in Isikosa. Um, also asking my dad about, about more and more and more and more. Because mm. growing up in Tanzania, or like at that time, these were people you played with. Do you know what I mean? And were friends with. So it's very fascinating because that also draws the landscape of the Eastern Cape, Alice, um, Grahamstown, um, East London, going up to Mtata and other areas. And you start seeing it. So it not only becomes about things um, coming out of your mouth, but it becomes about geography, you know? And once you have, once you can paint your own landscape and you can speak it and, and, and be sophisticated about how you speak about landscape, I think that there's something so liberating there, you know, that doesn't need for you to, to walk with a title deed for, for land. Of course, that's important. Mm -hmm. But the land becomes and takes another form and shape. Land is very important, please don't get me wrong, but there's ways in which you can also sophisticate it by speaking it into life, by imagining and how you, like I always say, how you're gonna decorate like your land, whatever, yeah. And I think that words and, and written things and especially written things in languages that do not need you to have a student loan that do not need you to travel 10 kilometers or catch two trains to go and learn. Language should be important and, and, be, and, and it should be respected, the idea of the mother tongue. And we're speaking, of course, on the shoulder of giants when we say that as well, because we're not the first people on this beautiful Monday night coming up and talking about the importance of the mother tongue. In Cape Town, the past decade, like I, I remember when I first arrived, there was the mother tongue project which, um, uh, yeah, which um, also uh, Mandla worked in, Fanisha worked in. And also seeing those plays, you know, I think I had seen a Gibson Kenter play um, in the late 80s in East London. And then that all jumped between the Nutcracker and all of that to then land in, 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 uh, in Kosa language, sort of like original, like um, contemporary works written by Mandla or are directed by Fanisha. Or, or mismatch it, yeah. So, yeah, it is a full circle moment. And then I land up in Lovedale because, yeah, we live close here now. <laughs> and and guys, it was intense in the sense that um, 
there was no electricity, there was no running water, and this had been um, a case for, for years. And um, this leads me back to the idea of dignity. You know, um, how do we then speak of language in such beautiful ways when we haven't taken care of a language that has taken care of us so much in losing and finding us? Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's something that, um, that is emotional for me, you know, because it's beautiful stories. And, and the link... Oh yeah, what's your relationship? Um, um, what's your relationship? I think we've spoken about that. And I would love to add that language pushes me to a place whereby I really do see people's faces more and, and their circumstances more. And I humanize them and I make visible this idea of Ubuntu, you know? Um, I would love to learn every language in the world, but I can't. Uh, because I can't afford to. <laughs> Maybe I can, but um, I would love that because then you can get to see the nuance of how people are instead of using stereotype, which you can use, but it's nice to use stereotype on a rich surface of many nuances and multicultural things instead of just having stereotype falling flat on a, on a linoleum tile or something, you know? Yeah. Uh, in terms of talking about dignity and reintroducing oneself to the mother tongue. I think, I think we also must be careful. This, this question of mother tongue can sometimes feel like an exclusionary term. Yeah, right? yeah. Because if, let's say, um, let me use myself in this example because it's easier that way. It's more human as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, my dad is Sutu. My mom is Kosa. Um, our heritage, you know, kind of culturally speaking, whatever, culturally mm -hmm. speaking, whatever that means. Culturally is, speaking, is, is, is cultural. <laughs> cultural. Um, is passed down by the patriarchal line. And yet okay. we don't talk about the father tongue, we talk about the mother tongue. Mm. But then, so you could be sort of, but you are fluent in this class. Mm. So there's kind of, there's, there's this thing, there's, I think I th sometimes think about it in three ways. And this is, these are not my terms. Um, a theorist called Maconi separated them. Is, um, there's language expert, you can have language expertise. You can have language affiliation. Mm. And then you can have language inheritance. And I, I, thinking about those things can, can be really beautiful. So I, I, I uninherited, I guess, is Tosa and Susutu because it was mm. given to me and then yeah. it was systematically moved out. A friend of mine who um, would describe herself as Wumzulu uh, says, you know, it's a funny thing. I remember learning English. I remember, I remember that moment, but I can't remember unlearning Isizulu. I can't remember it. And yeah. that, again, speaks to like, that quiet violence of the powers of language, right? And which ones are, are put at the top of the hierarchy for whatever set of reasons. Mm. Um, and I have an affiliation to both Susuta and Nisthasa and, um, and expertise more in Nisthasa than I do in Susuto. But I don't consider myself less Susuto because I feel like that'd be denying a part of my, my heritage because I am kind of this amalgamation of both things. Yeah. Um, and it makes me think that this is not a uniquely South African thing, right? Yeah. Like you could be um, first generation immigrant, a Ghanaian who's now living in London, um, but you, whatever language that you, know, you brought over is now not really spoken at home or you feel shame for it because of where it is that you find yourself or you could be Puerto Rican and not speak Spanish yeah. and you live in you know, the American mainland. Um, but does that make you any less Puerto Rican because you don't speak Spanish? And I sometimes find that there is a loss of dignity in the way that black people meet each other when somebody has lost language, is trying to find their way back. Mm. And you're met with this kind of, hey, boy. Yeah. It was a Yeah. Hey, boy. Good day, yeah. It kind of marks you with this thing, like you have this, um, the mother gets stripped away from you, right? Yes, yeah. yes. And so you feel undignified in that moment. And you go, well, I'm trying to find my way back home. But on my way, the people I fought would be my family are like, 
You've been away so long. <laughs> it be the well, ones you know. <laughs> it be the ones you know. It be the ones you know. <laughs> but it's so I like I like I like the idea of the nuances because for me, I'm Bata. My heritage is that of Bata, which is an amalgamation of um, Kosa, <laughs> Swazi, and Zulu. Right. My mother also on the other side is an amalgamation of Sutu and Kosa. So we grew up in a place whereby the predominant people were Kosa and we spoke Kosa, you know? So that, but that, that to me adds a richness of mm. knowing that you can't claim, you can never claim one language as yours or language can be used to kill nationalism even, you know? Just because you speak a certain language does not mean that you belong to this nation. And the beauty that comes out of that visually is something that the globe, yeah, I think that the globe, the, the, the reason why my, my experience of life is enhanced is because of artworks and things that come from people who've had those experiences, right? Um, dignity, wow, dignity and language in South Africa. Um, I'm shaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's it is it's such a it's it, you can't divorce language from emotion right because that's how fanon says um uh, language is is god gone astray in the flesh i love mm. that i love that i'm telling you who i am how i'm feeling um what my story is mm. and it's embedded in the languages that i use um, in the language I dream in, in the language I pray in, mm. in the language I speak to my ancestors in, those aren't always the same thing, right? And there's, they, it's, it often feels like a portal, right? That yeah. is the, the, one of the things that used to scare me, funny story, is I was like, oh, if I don't learn my language, no matter who's trying to stop me, I don't care. When I am on my way, on the waiting list to being a, an ancestor, crossed over, transitioned, am I going to be allowed in? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> am I, yeah, am I going to be allowed in? Because I don't speak the language of spirit, right? Yeah. I don't speak the language of people. Um, so that was one of the things that encouraged me. And why I, I'm so obsessed with our project with Lovedale and it being 200 years old is it gives a kind of depth and history and evidence that we've been doing this. Yeah. This is not new. Yeah. But we, we didn't learn this like just now. Um, we, we, we can lay claim to this, yeah. right? I mean, I, I promise you, do an exercise now. Anybody, do an exercise now. Go to an yeah. exclusive book or take a lot or a library or whatever. Go to the children's section where African language, the African language children's books are. Look at who they're written by. It's so-and-so for Namarwa, so-and-so yeah. for Nick Park, a Janssen, a Jones or whatever. They're not written by us. They might be mm. illustrated by us, but they are stories. They are folk tales. Yeah. But they have been archived into that form by somebody else who's not, you know, wouldn't claim yeah. necessarily that that is With that collective experience language and, and, and by, yeah. yeah. Um, and then if you go to exclusive books later and you, say you're young adults now, or you're you and me, and I'm trying to find a novel. I like to read. I want to find a novel in his closet that wasn't written 50 years ago, that was written last year. Who are the contemporary writers? Is there a market? Is it yeah. valuable? Who's yeah. telling us that there isn't a market and that it isn't valuable? Are book, we sales, still book sales are telling the world that, that, that you can't print on a book, you know? So, um, yeah, like when you tell your parents you want to be a writer, they laugh at you. Let alone you want to write Ngoli Milako. You know, it becomes something that, 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 that is really, really, really tough. And of course, there's many, many other things here. But at the end of the day, we are left with a question of we are standing at the precipice of having the opportunity to work and save something. Are we then going to say 
ulimi lutati you know um mm-hmm. are we going to be in positions whereby we are now going to say it was done to us you know um mm-hmm. and for me i find that there, there, there is that liberation of actually saying no Mm. not this time i'm in a position to let you know who's going to let someone else know that there's a place that needs us that could enter the 21st century you know that because those are usually the the the, the, the those are the big questions the sustainability of what umdana wami is going to do once i put her in a trance like to go study something in rhodes or whatever you know mm. that mm. involves writing and uh, these days we have digitization these days we have um the idea like i i don't i do know that there is an industry around uh, a translation i don't know if it's something i'm making up you know there is i think that they i think television and film are doing a far better job than literature at the moment mm. i think that that role really is and music yo music you know what musicians make new languages every day are doing the most for indigenous languages i put them up on the pedestal they are doing the lord's work abo hi 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 it's incredible um but the, even the politics of writing for television who is in the writing room <laughs> okay as an exercise who's in the writing room who's writing um, those stories and then you as the actor get the script in english written by someone who's not you okay yeah and then you have to sit and do the exercise of translating so you'll translate it as best as you possibly can right and there but there are people who are who's biz, who are in the business of language of finding the thing that's closest in idiom to that thing and there's not just a word for word translation right there's like there's a meaning translation an intention translation that also has to occur not just a vocabulary um translation that needs to happen so even in that developing those things as skills and zikon it's yeah. not like again that we're starting from scratch we're not starting anything from scratch we're just helping you we'd like to see i think that they were so best positioned as an institution and not just for us because digitization can mean that yeah. you, could, you know love you could be work. one of the biggest publishers in um where did you go oh <laughs> <laughs> what are the um, biggest yeah, publishers in sub saharan africa now. so uh this is the latest one i just got from there uh it's called mihwali molao bas ya matwan yeah so and this was published in the early 1900s or as well like 1904 so these things are here these things need to be preserved you know um one one of the wonderful things i learned last week about lovedale as well was that they still when they used to make books because they don't they, they don't they don't make books in you because they can't really turn on the machine you know what i mean but when they used to they used to um also commission artists from around the way um one of the famous ones actually that um did once like pass through lovedale was obabu george pemba who um who still whose works is still on the lovedale stuff and even like in the lovedale textbooks he's got like his liner cuts in there and that's such a wonderful thing that cannot disappear because now you're not only teaching about language you're teaching about art history from a simple cover you know what i mean um and you're also like asking about like um various other things like how do you because the story doesn't stay in word mm. the story oh. doesn't and i think that it it like um it it, it yeah it, it when we separate media we are only speak about this but when we separate media oh you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing this and you're doing that that already becomes an affront on the language that i think in and i want to create in you know So if someone makes you want to choose one medium they already going against the multiplicity of languages that are going inside of me and they want me to see a world with one way of doing it no and i think that that's um on some bullshit um yeah um so the, the the dignity of the matter right now is that there isn't any if we could like really speak about the the lovedale situation um 
it it will close like it will close when it when it closes and all we are working with at the moment is a the first um step of the of the matter is to just pay tribute to the people you know to just to just to just be good people and pay tribute to those who actually held the doors open for us for such a long time you know and even let us in sometimes when we were, when it was not very convenient for them um the second step is of course um the consultations that we have been doing already with people who are sending us on one direction to another direction to somehow um yeah to somehow say that there is there is a world with like you guys saw this there's many people who see this and we are here to help and that has been such a beautiful beautiful moment because that then carries through this fundraising moment into a sustainability right and sustainability for me and i'd like for you to describe the sustainability of language as well for me it is in having a translation industry you know one of my biggest dreams has always been like uh being this big um uh, big artist from africa going to paris and i come with a translator you know because it is something <laughs> that is yeah. it is something that is so natural that side to have an interlocutor and all of that 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 it doesn't become about power but it just becomes about the fact that you know why it's yeah <laughs> i just want to speak my damn language you know um i do believe that yeah um another thing we speak south africans with english subtitles i always say because we have this <laughs> mishmash you know we have this um uh, wonderful i should I, i will do it but you che i should i should rock up with a hype man <laughs> you should <laughs> like, oh, i dare you <laughs> i trust a hype man <laughs> um, you should <laughs> Yeah, but, but um I think that there is an industry to that. There is an industry because also the Xhosa language is not the Xhosa language that is in this box is already not dated but so much has been added to it because now our townships have the Congolese influence, have the West African influence, have the Eritrean like Ethiopian influence and I I'm fascinated by how those generations are going to be speaking in Xhosa, expressing themselves. in this class they are going on a strawberry bomb hey sifuni mali imaliza ni english you know i'm talking about sustainability it it's interesting i don't know how many people actually know the story of lovedale um but just to skim over it very quickly um you know started in 1823 was almost destroyed during the uh, war of the axe uh, in around 1830 something uh, again in another war gutted by fire in 1847 and on and on it goes right there's so many points in history that it's either moved or destroyed or but it it continues to sustain itself mm. and you and i are not the first people to try to come together to to do something about lovedale absolutely um, in 2001 um correct correct me on any of these final points at yeah 2001 lovedale goes up for auction 18 of the employees at the time uh nobody from corporate or government as we yeah. as far as we know um makes a bid for the business and so they decide no we're invested in this and we have a vested interest in this let's put together whatever monies we have including some people's pension funds yeah cash goes out and put those monies to use in preserving and keeping alive what we know is important and so you can imagine this daunting task right having put so much into what you value so much and suddenly being thrust into the position of being a business owner yes running a business is a very difficult thing even for people who are studied in it who are proficient in it who are certificated in that area running a business is a tough thing businesses yeah. fail all the time so one might imagine that whilst you are very very good at doing what it is that you do learning to run a business can have its challenges and so it's run up against some challenges since 2001 up until now 
I'm aware of at least two or three other occasions where people have got together to say, guys, Lovedale is going to close. Please, can we do something? Mm -hmm. There was an interview I remember that Joanne Joseph c conducted about three years ago. And I mm -hmm. thought that everything was fine until yeah, you contacted one thinks me that. Um, a couple months ago to say, yeah, hey, when I went to our beloved Lovedale and things are not good. No water, mm. no running electricity. There's no phone. There's no point of sales machine. There's it's no point sad. of sales, yeah. It's so sad. And again, everyone that we speak to and tell them what dire straits the space is in, they just cannot believe it. Yeah. Um, so you and I are not professional fundraisers. <laughs> no, I mean, no, no. <laughs> but what we know is this. Our planning can't be short term. Mm. It can't be... Um, that we're raising money as a stopgap to pay the rent. Whatever rent yeah. we need to pay the rent, uh, whatever money we can possibly give to the three remaining custodians, some have passed away, some have um, decided to pull away from, mm. from the venture. There's three remaining um, now. There are three who are remaining. Uta Bishop, who is 70, 74, 76 years old, somewhere around mm. there, and has been with the person's for, for 48 years, almost yeah, 50 years. Yeah, since the 70s. That's crazy. Um, and, but hasn't earned a stable income for the last 10 years. Whatever little bit that they have, maybe would eat a little bit, send some home, look after the kids, and then put it straight back into trying to keep the lights on. Trying yeah. to fight the landlord. Not fight, but trying to you know, negotiate with the landlord. To keep, to, to, to keep the pay. landlord at bay. You yes, know, to say, oh, because... you know, here's something. Please just buy us a little bit of time. And that little bit of time has meant that the, the landlord is now owed like 1.6 million rand. <laughs> and is in court. I, right. And I think whilst the landlord is fighting for their money, there is kind of a real acknowledgement that must be given to them, credit that must be given. Um for their contribution to help yeah. us keep the doors of Lovedale open for as long as they have. Do you know yeah. how long it takes to accumulate 1.6 million rands worth of rent? <laughs> you, you don't do that in one month, right? So this is like months and months, possibly even years yeah. of them doing it. So somehow this space wants to survive. It has shown but us I, that it can survive it, as well. It's shown us that it can survive. But what we know for sure is two things. One, you know there's that saying I've said this to you on the phone before you know there's that saying that when an, old, an elder in the village dies it's as if a library has, has um, burnt down Yeah. I don't think sitting here today and I say this with all seriousness with no hyperbole mm. if we let Lovedale go if we don't do everything that is possible to preserve this space we have no idea what we would have lost. Yeah. There is absolutely no telling the effect that in our time, we had an opportunity to do something to preserve our history and we didn't. Yeah. And we failed. There is... There, it, it, yeah. it gives me complications <laughs> to even think about the possibility. So we, we can't let it happen. Yeah just can't we can't be fighting for representation left and right we can't be fighting for our languages to be lifted up to the light to have dignity we can't and fight for dignity here is the space yeah here's the space that is the dis distributed our languages printed our languages for two hundred that is evidence that again we're not starting from the beginning and we're not going to hold on to that archive it, it would be well unto us Truly, truly. I, I, may, may, I answer, may I answer a question? Are there still books yes, that please. we can purchase in addition to donations? So um, the landscape there at the moment is that every time uh, Mali and I, uh, we come to this side, I usually buy um, a whole stack of books. Um, I usually have to go to the um, ATM machine around the, the, the corner and uh, go draw the money out and then go do that. Already that is such a convoluted way of paying that it only can bleed your business. So when we speak about helping Lovedale, we're speaking about those small um, details as well. Um, we say, yes, we're raising the funds to pay tribute, but for your spirit, say its name, you know, 
um, not at seven o'clock, like we say for, for the health workers, let's leave seven o'clock for the health workers. And we do our way of paying tribute to this place. Um, download a book. If you can download a book, we one day will have sort of like a love day available for downloads. Um, read something to your child about it. Um, find a way in which you can translate something in English to Isikosa from it, <laughs> because there's also that. Um, there will be like also needs for like laptops and all those various things to be needed. So it's a long-term project. And also it's a project that needs to make sure that it's sustainable. It is not just a gesture um, out of respect for the work that has gone in to this wonderful um, 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 space. Yeah. We're we need to lawyers the... too, sorry. We're yeah, need... we, need... we need lawyers. <laughs> we need, uh, we need uh, property, uh, intellectual property lawyers um, who will then one day go into a very, very interesting, um, yeah, uh, telling of where the, 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 the monies of, of all these like wonderful um, classics has been going to. Um, as we know that it's supposed to be shared between the, the, the authors and also the, the press, um, we do know that there's other sort of like presses that have been pressing um, um, the works um, with and without permission. So this project, um, yeah, is, is, is quite interesting and we've taken it on because of its size and also because it will bring to attention what, what yeah, what we... What we treasure. Yes, Lerato. Yeah, all these places, Funda, Fuba, all of those places went down. Because, yeah, I always say I really do think that those in power do thrive from this confusion and from this darkness. Because that's the best way they can feed you with um, really substandard ideals, you know? And, um, yeah. So the, the three-phase project. Um, yeah, we've spoken about the two phases, right? The first is to pay tribute to the custodians. The Which second is what one, we're currently doing now, huh? It's what, yeah. we're, what we're raising the 300,000 rand for. And this is another question. Sorry, I to, to jump into mm, your mouth. Mm. Just so people are clear. So we're, we're in a, uh, the first phase of the three-phase project, as you so rightly said. The 300,000 rand would go directly to the three remaining custodians who have kept the space alive up until now. Yeah. Even if we raise 10,000 rand. Even if we raise 500,000 rand, mm -hmm. that money, the 300,000 rand will go directly to the custodians and whatever is remaining will be put in trust for future use so that they can keep making an income. Mm -hmm. um, our, our, our impression at the moment is that they want to continue to work there and to uh, yes. pass on the skills of how to even use the press. I mean, yes. that's, you talk about artisanal skills that can be passed yeah. on. They want to be invested, but... It's difficult if you're not able to see money that was going to sustain you in real term things like a roof over your head and, you know, clothes for your children and food in your belly. So mm. we have two weeks. We might extend it a little bit. Uh, I th yeah, for I think we should. Weeks so that it allows people to put it as a line item in their already very... Um, Dressed uh, up, detailed budget line. Because it's tough we times know. for everybody. We have tough times for everybody and for those who have contributed already. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. To have any little bit that you can put towards this at a time when everybody's watching every cent and rand yeah. is mind blowing to me. That's, it really yeah. is. So that we say the deepest sincerity, thank you. So that's phase one. So we've yeah. got we've got about the three to four more weeks in phase one. Then we go into phase two, which is um, phase two is basically the consultations um, uh, with uh, people and strategists who are going to be able to then table something that we can present to the Lovedale people for a long project, a long-term project, um, which of course will include going into digitizing and going into translations, which are two industries that could happen anywhere with the COVID times and also could be a, could be a plant back to the, the, the people of Alice who I'm sure are the greater community that have also been taking care of the space, you know? 
Um, somebody makes a point here about the preservation is about the books and the intellectual property and not necessarily the, the space itself. And that there are different ways of preserving the works mm. rather than the space. And I think that's a really important point and the one that we keep yeah. talking about and forth. It would be beautiful to keep the space yes. um, because it's been there for so long. And it should, in my opinion, humble opinion, um, mm. should have heritage status anyway, but it yes. doesn't. Which is, um, one of the, um, which is one of the shortcomings that the whole process of um, securing um, Lovedale has been all about. The, 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 it's, the fact that it has not been recognized, um, the brand and the, 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 the space as um, a heritage um, uh, object is quite, is quite fascinating. And I think this is very much linked to the rights and, and, and many, many other things that are involved in the story. But oh, the, indeed, the true, to, yeah. Yeah, and the true value does lie in the intellectual property. So it doesn't matter whether that space, as it were, is online, uh, whether it's a building somewhere. Um, so, uh, if it were a building, I'd really love it to continue to be in Alice because, I mean... It is Alice, reasons. yeah. I mean... <laughs> Okay, can you say love there without saying Alice? You really, I mean, you can't. Okay. Can you say Bethlehem without saying Palestine? <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, so yes, I think the true value is in the intellectual property, but it, it would be amazing if we could do both. Um, yeah. But if we have to choose um, for, you know, very complex reasons, then... It would be. Um, and then the third phase of the project, IT would be? Ownership. How would a community own it? Would an individual own it? Um, I do know that the threesome are totally against um, an individual owning it. Already, they've been getting phone calls um, for that. But they are worried that um, once someone gets it, they'll be thrown by the wayside. And it will be something that lacks any community touch. And of course, that's the nature of capitalism. That's the nature of most things, you know. But I think that they're also, they're holding on in this faith that is so, so superhuman to me. Um, yeah, it's, it's like, have, have I held on for so long to something that doesn't give me anything back? Mm. And definitely, Lerato, it should be a community-led space. It should be a space that hires the community, that hires the skills of translation of the community. So those are two birds with one stone, right? Sustainability, dignity, and language, maybe, whereby the translations industry can be used to empower a community. And digitizing. And um, digitizing also like, it adds new skills to people, you know? Um, and with regards to ownership, let's talk about who owns most of these titles. Um, and how come the guys, how come the guys are not getting their dough? SABC Encore um, is the one who's been playing in Mubebe Nyanya ad nauseum. Um, and, 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 and they haven't been getting that money. So we need to know, because knowing about those things will help other industries as well. You know, knowing your rights helps other people realize their rights. And we mustn't stay in our shutter boxes. This is not just a question for publishing and printing. This is a question for information, you know? And, and yeah. <laughs> with what you've done. For oh, it's good on, and yay! <laughs> and congratulations, <laughs> love fangirling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maintain composure, maintain composure. Mm. That's my teacher, man. That's my yeah. mentor. That's and, a real one. And, and it's, it's because of that that those things can't go as well because we need to say those names, you know? Absolutely. We're going to get kicked off of this Instagram live. Okay, my soon. darling. How does one it say gives goodbye? Us an hour. Oh, so, okay. Oh, okay. How do you say so, that? I don't, I don't know. How do you save it, Nobisa? Can you send us a tutorial before before it goes before something happens to it? <laughs> oh, um, okay.
Ja. Oh. Ja, yeah, a lot of the, the, the copyright laws, uh, Performance Protection Act, um, what happens when works, because remember we're talking about titles that some of them are almost 200 years old. Yeah. When, when those works go into the public domain, what happens to them? I mean, these are the questions we really need to figure out. But also not just thinking about the archive as um, uh, Ms. Yusuf says, is not just a place that talks about the past, where we store things about the mm. past and look and look and retrieve. This is an archive. This is an but archive. The, but the, uh, yes, this is the archive. We are creating, this is an archive. What we're yeah. doing right now is creating archive. So to, to think about not only what has been, what's past and can be preserved, but developing language now that we can put into the archive and then continue to 2023 and beyond. Yeah. So, um, we have to figure out how to say this. IGTV would be the. We're learning a lot about publication. <laughs> yes, I don't know what that means. You know that I don't know what that means. Um, okay, IGTV we'll save it. Mm -hmm. But guys, um, once again, um, if you have some coins to give us, um, if you guys can just spare a moment a day read something of your language, write something in your language. Um, and just, and just, yeah, pay tribute to those who really did come before us and, and, and those who actually wanted this to be our inheritance. You know, we all know that it's not to be spent inheritance is to be passed down until it probably grows. So, um, yeah, go to our backer buddy, um, do what needs to be done there. Tell a buddy. Um, and write and write. Write in your, in your languages. Put dignity on your experience. Yeah. Donate. <laughs> if you absolutely can. IT, thank you for this. This has been heartwarming. It has been healing. Yes. It has been illuminating it's been yeah. empowering it's given it's amplified amplified voices and um it's been really beautiful to have this exchange publicly and i am fueled even more to just to keep going for the long run beautiful. so for anybody who wants to continue to donate our our the backup buddy the links are all in our um our bios um, and also on the victory of the word page. Thank you so much to everybody who contributed. To thank the you guys. Chats we've seen and they've just gone so fast. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And continue to engage with us. Um, just slide into our DMs or pop us an yeah. email at victoryoftheword at gmail dot com. Beautiful. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Wait. So I press end, ne? Yeah, and then it's going to ask if we want to save it, and we must. Are you sure you want to end your live video? End now. <laughs>